Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 69 of the Solosaurus podcast. I'm Michael Eckenfels. And I'm Martin Gonzalez. And today, we're going to talk about a well-known game called Friday, a solo adventure by Friedman Fries and published by Rio Grande Games back in 2011. We both felt that this would be a perfect game to discuss as it's so easy to get into, has a small footprint, is inexpensive, and most importantly, it's still in print. That's important. That's very important. As for me, uh, it's also been on my table and on my mind a lot recently because I have been playing my, here comes my personal plug, my personal print and play retheme of this game based on the really excellent 2015 Matt Damon film, The Martian. Have you seen that movie, Michael? Yes, I have. How do you feel about that movie? I like that movie. And, you know, I saw your post, but I wasn't equating it with Friday. I saw what you were doing, but I was like, oh, that's cool. But I didn't I didn't really go deeply into it. I'm like, I got to check that out later. But, yeah, that I'm not I'm not much for retheming or print play. <laughs> I'm yeah, not I, I, uh, I, I rethemed uh, Mar- uh, Friday to The Martian, and um, I think it works really, really well, if I do say so myself. If you're interested in finding out more about my retheme, my print and play retheme, we will add the Board Game Geek link uh, to the show notes for this episode. Yes, we will. We will absolutely do that. And that's a good reminder. Just don't let me forget. So if it's in there, then <laughs> you're listening to this, then it's not in there, then we got a problem. <laughs> hey, Siri, remind me to remind Michael to put that in the show notes. <laughs> she, okay. She did. She actually put a reminder in my phone. This is amazing. We're living in the future. This podcast is brought to you by Stone Valley Games, your friendly, distant game store. Check them out at stonevalleygames.com. Head over to the site, check out what they got available, especially their blog posts. If you go click on articles and then the Stone Valley Life to read what's going on there, you'll get all kinds of good articles that Eric and Wendy, his wife, put up there on the site. So uh, it's great information. And today, actually yesterday, rather, there was a really good post about the latest games they've got over there, including Black Rose, which is something that's on my radar, but more importantly, Aliens Bug Hunt. I want to play that so badly. (laughs) Same here. Same here. Uh, So I will say this, like uh, last episode, last couple of episodes, either you or Brandon were asking me, Martin, uh, have you actually purchased something from Stone Valley Games? And I've always said no, sadly. So this morning when I saw Aliens Bug Hunt, I added it to my Stone Valley cart uh, faster than you could say Ripley. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Faster than get away from her, you... No, I'm not going to say it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a family podcast, darn it. Well, yeah, I I just love the Aliens universe. Alien and Aliens, and then Alien 3, maybe not so much, but Alien Resurrection was pretty good and blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm a big fan, too, of the RPG. Probably will never get to play it, but, you know, that whole universe just fascinates me. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the first two films, and then... Um... After that, I, I pretended that nothing existed. Um, <laughs> so that's. <laughs> but I will tell you, and I was telling you right before I started the recording, that when I first saw Aliens in the movie theater with my friends, I was so incredibly jazzed coming out of that movie theater. We were actually cavorting around the parking lot. We didn't want to go home and we were jumping up on car fenders and repeating lines from the film that we had just seen that we, that of course we were going to see many, many, many more times again. That was just, I, one of my all time favorite movie experiences was that movie was aliens. The summer of the mid eighties, the late eighties was just like a golden era of film. <laughs> and that really was one of the major ones there for sure. Oh man. It, it had so many endings. Like it, something it, you think it was and, uh, just, I don't want to do any spoilers. You know, of course it's a, maybe it's a 20, 25 year old movie, 30 year old oh, movie, but 35. <laughs> at least. Yeah. Um, but man, yeah, that's wow. Just thinking, just thinking about how I felt watching that movie and how I felt afterward is giving me goosebumps right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those, game, those games. <laughs> it's one of those yeah. movies that holds up really well over time, too, I think. I mean, it's like yeah. the, the thing is definitely one for me. Even the special effects Ooh. today. That movie's like 40 plus years old, man. And it's it looks awesome. Ooh. Awesome. You, you yeah. mentioned the thing. You know, as we're recording <laughs> this, it's on Kickstarter right now. There is a uh, by Pendragon Games. Really? I thought there was another. Did you know one. that? I thought there was a game called The Thing Outpost, something about Outpost 31 or something like that. Yeah, that's that already exists, and apparently that's really good. 
but there is a there is a there is a miniatures based um, a hidden role game uh, called the thing. Uh, obviously licensed, and it's on Kickstarter right now, and um, uh, it's billing itself as a one to eight player game. Sadly. I looked into it, and I'm not going to get into it because I think that they're they're designating it as a one player game is very deceptive. You you really can't do an effective soloable hidden role game, and no, you can't. Yeah, that's they're crazy. they're trying to shoehorn it into one. So I was going to yeah. say that's that's sort of like the uh, original thing board game. I believe it's kind of the same way. It's like playing Battlestar Galactica solo. I don't think you can really no. do it. <laughs> no, you can't. Yeah. Although, and we, we keep on going off on tangents. You mentioned Battlestar Galactica, another one of my favorite shows. Here's my frustration. Here, my quick frustration. Here's my ten my my ten second rant about that. Um, every Battlestar Galactica game, why does it have to be a hidden role game? Because me, I would be happy if my Battlestar Galactica game was me as Adama barking orders to Mister Gata to you know <laughs> get get the Dreadus contact and you know uh, get the. <laughs> I mean that. To me, that's Battlestar Galactica. Is I would I just want to be on the CIC and I want to be a Dama and I want to bark orders. That that's there's nothing wrong with that. That would be my Battlestar Galactica game. I don't care about the hidden role part. I don't care. It's a Cylon. <laughs> We're such nerds. Oh, like the Battlestar Galactica board game. Oof, I gotta do the miniature battles too. You know the funny. Th- <laughs> that's right. There's actually a minis game for that as well that I totally ignored because I, I invested in Star Wars X-Wing minis for so long and uh, I, I just didn't ever mm. played it. They were just so cool. <laughs> and I couldn't stop buying the damn things. And I saw these and I was like, no. I think, uh, <laughs> I think you're not alone in that, you know, getting yeah. everything for Star Wars miniatures and then and then not actually playing it. Yeah, I ended up selling everything, just, I just oh. was touching it, you know, and it's like, I don't have the time for this. I don't have the room for it. Let's get rid of it. Anyway, I was hoping that you would still be basking in the uh, warm glow of ownership. <laughs> no, no, unfortunately. <laughs> Wave 2 didn't even do anything for me. So anyway. All right. Hey, don't we have a podcast about we Friday? Sorry, okay, guys. all right. Okay. Well, let's, <laughs> let's talk about the news first. So today's solo news. Okay is brought to you by tableforone.me where the solo source podcast gets its one player game news. Thanks always to Frederick Schultz of tableforone.me for his constant labor of love in bringing us the solo gaming news. And by the way, you can also read his solo gaming news blog on board game geek. And we will add that link to the show notes as well. So there are, a few, well, there's several new things that we would like to talk about, I think. And the first one is really cool. It's by publisher DVG taking the Warfighter game system into the realm of sorcery and adventure with a game called, well, th- this particular bit is called Plumeria Core Game. And if you're not familiar with Warfighter, it's a solo game, but it can also be co op if you would like, but it's easily soloable. It's a card game where you uh, lay out objective cards and then you have soldiers or troops or whoever, whatever it is. In this case, I imagine it'd be fighters or mages and such moving from card to card, fighting bad guys, uh, interacting with objectives, trying to accomplish goals. It's, it's a really neat system. I have the entire world war two system. I've got all the Europe ones. I've got the Pacific ones and I've got the modern of course. War fighters. Well, yes. Well, you know, I, of I course you do. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say the word. Uh, so this is <laughs> cool because uh, let me read the story here. Publisher Dan Beerson games is aiming to expand the scope of the popular Warfighter game system to include fictional settings and time periods, starting with the Warfighter. Well, excuse me, starting with Warfighter, the fantasy card game. This standalone iteration allows one to six players to cooperatively explore the magic realm of Plumeria, going on quests, slaying monsters. It's similar to other entry, previous entries in the Warfighter system in that it's the same core design of card and hand management while you're simultaneously introducing new and exciting elements like a dedicated campaign system, which allows your heroes to travel throughout the land and gain experience and along the way. And even more fascinating, the story here says, is the fact that the fantasy set can be mixed and matched with other Warfighter games as described by the publisher. And it goes on to talk about this, which is a really cool thing about this system. If you want to, say, have your modern fighters, you can build a deck of sealed 
soldiers with modern weapons like M4 carbines and law rockets, and you could put them into a fantasy dungeon or have them assault the D-Day beaches at Normandy. Uh, or you can put a bunch of fighters doing the same thing. They could be fighting in the Battle of the Bulge or, you know, whatever uh, fighters as in uh, sword play, you know, fighters and mages and clerics and such going in the Battle of the Bulge and stuff like that. That's just how the system works. It's very flexible. So if you're interested in doing some kind of uh, off-topic, a historical kind of a game, you can certainly do that with the Warfighter system. And there's certainly plenty of stuff out there. And Martin, I believe this is one that's on your radar too, is it not? Yes, definitely. I am looking at this one. I don't own any of the Warfighter stuff, but you know... You've been talking about it recently. Some other folks on Solo Board Gamers Facebook group have been talking about it recently. It's on Kickstarter right now. Oh, I'm tempted. I'm sorely tempted, <laughs> I got to tell you. Although I am waiting for the um, inevitable Star Wars and Cthulhu versions. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not, if, no, well, <laughs> you, you say that. You, they, I doubt that they would get the license for that. But you never know. But at the same time, I imagine there might be a Martin Print and Play retheme coming very soon to a... Can, can you imagine Warfighter, the Mandalorian <laughs> version? I would be all over that. Yeah. Yeah. They'd make a <laughs> ton of money with that, but I'm sure the licensing rights would probably cost a, a nice, nice sum. Oh, I'll just make, <laughs> I'll just make a personal retheme for myself. That's it. Yeah. Well, yeah there you go. Yeah. yeah I, absolutely. I'll be able to enjoy it. I don't care about the rest of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's mine. Mine. My precious. <laughs> mine. Oh, yeah. Lord of the Rings version. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, but in all seriousness, I'm very interested in this warfighter thing. Um, so you say it's hand management. So is it kind of like Sentinels of the Multiverse, if you've ever played that game? I've or, played that on Steam, and it's been a long yeah. time. So I don't but, remember. But like each character has its own unique deck of cards, and you don't add to or you don't take away from. You just go into each fight. And that's your that those represent your character's powers, abilities, weapons, you know, whatever. Pretty um, much it. Is that pretty much it? Okay. Okay. So, yeah. okay, that that gives me an idea of what uh, what I'm what I'm going to get into. I think one of the cool aspects of it is you can build your squads. Uh, equipment up so you can choose the weapons choose the loadout the ammo the uh, loadout mm. uh, medic packs stuff like that you know so if you try a mission and you fail you can maybe ooh, maybe i didn't bring enough heavy weapons or maybe i need a machine gun or you know what however that equates to in this fantasy world i imagine maybe i need a mage more ranged combat types you know that kind of a thing and it, it really makes you think and, and and it has some replayability in that regard so you can maybe try a approaching a mission from a different angle maybe I, might... I need to equip my fighter with a surface to air rocket launcher yeah well in, in this yeah. system you can do that <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> so i might have to send you one of my sets here just so you've got it and we can maybe talk about this in an episode if the if the listeners yeah. are interested in that that would be so, amazing awesome yeah so the next story is a space themed strategy board game called galactic era that is returning to kickstarter with added solo play now this i'm not familiar with the story goes publisher cj games and designer channing jones are gearing up to for a second attempt at bringing the strategy board game galactic era to fruition this previous kickstarter campaign was launched in december of last year it did not manage to reach the targeted funding goal okay there you go since then the designer has been hard at work developing several aspects of the game including the addition of an official solo mode Similar mm. to Twilight Imperium and Eclipse, mm. Galactic Era is a 4X science fiction themed strategy game of exploration and conquest among the stars of the universe. Uh, you, the, okay, so let me read this next bit yeah. here. The, the thing that separates this upcoming space opera from the rest, which I think is important, <laughs> of the pack is the implementation emph and emphasis of a moral alignment system for the player characters. Depending on which way their inner compass is pointing, players will be able to utilize certain aspects of the game in their favor. For example, Champions okay. of Light are able to ally with advanced civilizations that you might come across during your intergalactic travels. Alternatively, as a harbinger of darkness, you are rewarded for being more aggressive in your actions. And, and I, I wanted to read all that out because the first thing I think Twilight Imperium, oh boy, that's, that's like, if you want to play a strategy game that's super heavy and takes eight hours to set up, Twilight Imperium's for you, man. I, <laughs> I haven't done it yet because that's not a solo game, 
Uh, I guess you could yeah. sell a wit if you're a, a sucker for punishment and you like that kind of thing. More power <laughs> to you, man. I have not been that motivated. I am a wholeheartedly a solo player, but nope. I would love to have that game, but there's just no way that's going to happen. Yeah, that sounds interesting. You know, one of my favorite um, computer games from from the before times uh, was uh, Master of Orion, Masters of Orion. And uh, this this is giving me, a, I'm looking at the art on table4one.me, and it's giving me a definite Masters of Orion vibe. Um, and I like the uh, what you mentioned about, hey, if you, based on your alignment, you can have a different path. Uh, through the game. I'm, I'm always, you know, seduced by games that give you that, um, you know, your decisions matter and, um, you know, or, or, or like playing those telltale like games like Walking Dead, where it's like you're faced with a moral dilemma and then you have to choose a path. And then you get this like ominous message on the screen saying that character will remember your choice. You know, <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, yeah, this, this sounds really interesting. It sounds cool. Um, I like the solo mode. Um, I and and I'm I like I, I'm always uh, interested by the four X um, kind of milieu kind of uh, uh, style of game. So right. yeah, I can appreciate a game that gives you multiple ways to address a goal. And this you mentioned an old computer game called Master of Orion. It reminded me of one called Birth of the Federation which was a really cool 4X type of space game where you could play any number of, of uh, groups in the Star Trek universe. Of course, go figure. I think I talked about Star Trek in the Mage Knight episode at length. Since that's the only copy I had, I didn't have Mage Knight itself. I had Star Trek Frontiers. But anyway, the 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 whole thing about that that was cool was that it made you play to your strengths. So if you played the Federation, you were good at diplomacy. It it would very much punish you if you went around trying to conquer planets as the Federation. Uh, simultaneously, if you played the Klingons, you were expected to go conquer planets. If you did not and use diplomacy, the game would punish you. So, you know, it made you play up to your strengths in that regard. But this sounds like it's much more flexible. And uh, I can definitely appreciate that. The more options, the better. That sounds cool. And the third and final thing we would like to talk about here, discover secrets and artifacts of ancient civilizations in Lost Ruins of Arnak from publisher Czech Edition Games. This one looks pretty cool. It reminds me of Indiana Jones. And in fact, I think it mentions that in here. It says, dust off the old Stetson hat, sort out your maps and plot a course for adventure in Lost Ruins of Arnak, an upcoming one to four player game of exploration and adventure designed by Min and Elwin and published by Czech Games Edition. As someone who grew up on a steady diet of uh, 80s adventure movies like Indiana Jones, The Goonies, and Romancing the Stone, all excellent films, by the way, mm -hmm. it is difficult to not get excited about the premise of Lost Ruins as described by the publisher here. On an uninhabited island in uncharted seas, explorers have found traces of a great civilization. Now you will lead an expedition to explore the island, find lost artifacts, and face fearsome guardians all in a quest to learn the island's secrets. It says it's a deck building and worker placement game of exploration, resource management, and discovery. And in addition to traditional deck builder effects, cards can also be used to place workers and new worker actions become available as players explore the island. It sounds interesting, it, it, but looking at it, it looks like Imhotep maybe or Stone Age to an extent, you know, worker placement, resource gathering, that kind of a thing. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Mark? I saw the phrase combines deck building and worker placement and instantly got very, very interested. I love deck <laughs> building. Uh, I love the deck building mechanism. I own over 20 deck building games. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm very interested in that. Um, I, you know, historically, I haven't been, I thought, I would have said, like, you know, uh, I'm not really that interested in worker placement, but I just recently did a survey of my um, of my collection, and I have about a dozen worker placement games. So I guess I'm also into worker placement, although not quite as much as deck building, but I'm open to it. And I do definitely have a hankering for a worker placement uh, experience every so often. Um, I'm just the type, you know, because, you know, worker placement is kind of associated with the Euro style game. And when you when you say Euro style game to me, I, I imagine a board game box with a with a pastoral field and a castle and some nobles walking around. And I see something like that and then instantly I fall asleep. Sorry. So, <laughs> <laughs> but but there are uh, worker placement games. I'm looking at my shelf right now. 
uh, that that are not like that, that are dripping with theme that appeals to me like, um, let's see, I'm looking at Outlive, which is a post-apocalyptic worker placement game. I'm looking at Eric Lang's The Godfather, Corleone's Empire, um, which is a, it's a worker placement game where you vie to be the uh, bosses of one of the, the, the five families in New York City, which is, and you actually get to do drive-by shootings and Put put the other um, the other family's guys in the East River. They can sleep with the fishes. You can actually do that in the game, which I think is amazing. Um, and I wrote a solo mode for it, so so that I could actually play it. Yeah. So anyway, all all of this to say that Lost Ruins of Arnak, uh, we we really need a good Indiana Jones type solo solo game because I don't think it really exists. You know what I mean? Um, so so I I would be down for that. There is kind of one, and mm. it's called uh, Fortune and Glory. I think I talked oh. about this one previously. I've heard of that but one, but I've not, I've not played it. Is that a flying yeah. frog game? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. yep. It uh, In the box, it, you can play it co-op, you can play it uh, solo, and you can play it competitively if you wish. All so right. I, I think I've talked about this before. I don't want to go into great detail if I have. <laughs> what people are going to go, oh, God, here we go again. You said Fortune and Glory? Fortune and Glory, yes. There are several expansions for it as well. Uh, okay. It's got the typical Flying Frog production, excellent production value. I think it comes with a CD as well, like some of their games do for mood music. <laughs> uh, it's just a great game of adventure and uh, finding lost artifacts and treasures. And uh, all the while you're struggling against the game system, which can be in the box. It's the mob, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Or the Nazis, which makes utter sense because we're talking Indiana Jones here, kind of. It's not an Indiana Jones game. It just reminds me of that that genre and that world. So, um, It's uh, not on uh, the Stone Valley Games website, so I can't add it to my cart right now. Gosh dang it. I imagine, <laughs> I imagine it might be out of print, actually. If you check BGG, I bet it's out of print. Ah, uh, shakes. You can't see me, but I'm shaking my fist at the sky. But yeah, I, I I would really appreciate a nice Indiana Jones feeling uh, game. It came out in 2011. Yep, and yeah, that's unavailable. There's several in the geek market. There's yeah, one for ninety five dollars. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm probably yeah, gonna have it's to, out of print. I'm gonna have to ha- uh, hold out for something on the secondhand market. I think right. we're digressing again here. So yeah, we're now twenty some minutes into. <laughs> we act- haven't we're- actually gotten to the review. That's great. That's no, awesome. But let's do that now. So <laughs> again, we're, just to remind everybody, in case you fell asleep here or forgot, <laughs> we no. are reviewing Friday. Huh? No, no. I. You know, I, the, some of the feedback we've been getting to our to our last episode is that folks actually like. Like, I, I found it funny that one person on the Solosaurus uh, Facebook group, you know, when you kind of apologetically said, "Sorry, our our episode clocked in at an hour and forty one um, minutes," and then one guy posted, and he goes, "You say that like it's, like it's a bad thing." <laughs> well, you know, there's going to be people that love that and people that this is crazy. I hate this, but I'm still going to download it and tell them why I don't like it, and that's perfectly fine. You know. I'm, 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 I'm very, I should say, I'm very happy with the feedback we've gotten so far. And I, yeah. I I'm just very appreciative great. of that. So yeah, I know, I know I've said this before, so I'll try not to harp on it. <laughs> uh, I'm just very, it's very cool because we're very cognizant of, of what we're putting out there and of your feedback as well. So uh, we appreciate the interaction. So we are reviewing, of course, Friday, a solo adventure designed by Friedman Freeze, published by Rio Grande Games in 2011. It's a one player and one player only game. And I want to say it was published under different publishers because it's almost been 10 years since this game came out. But Rio Grande, Rio Grande or Rio Grande? Anyway, <laughs> one of those, you know who they are, uh, is the one that I have. Friday is a solo only deck building game played over three stages as well as a final boss stage and you play in this game the eponymous eponymous yeah eponymous (laughs) Uh, let me start this over again bless you (laughs) we're all kinds of messed up here friday is a solo only let me let me pause friday is a solely god damn it (laughs) That's coming out too. Friday. Uh, that's all right. Friday is a solo only deck building game played over three stages as well as a final 
boss stage where you, in this game, you, damn it, one more time. Friday is a solo only deck building game where you play over three stages as well as a final boss stage as the eponymous title character of Friday, whose job it is to help Robinson. Now, Robinson recently was shipwrecked and washed ashore on your island. And uh, Robinson, he's a nice enough guy, but uh, he's extremely unprepared and unskilled. He's a newbie. He's like Tom Hanks' character in Castaway at first. He wasn't sure what to do or where he was going or how to do things. Uh, so his skills and, and abilities are represented by a deck of cards. It's called the Robinson cards, I believe. At the start of the game, there's 18 of them, I believe. Now, at the start, his deck is filled with absolutely, well, pretty much useless cards. I think there's two or three that are good and the rest just kind of stink. <laughs> so each turn, you're trying to help him face a hazard with his deck of cards, and you're trying to figure out ways to 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 beat these hazards as well as figure out ways to mitigate your, your lousy deck and, and get rid of the bad cards and replace them with good ones. Yeah. So um, if Robinson succeeds in um, overcoming the current hazard, then that card gets added to your deck. And then the cool thing about it is you can turn it uh, 180 degrees and then that goes into your discard pile. And then eventually as the game goes on, that can enter your hand as a new weapon or skill that can benefit Robinson by improving his deck. Now, if he, if he fails at overcoming that hazard, he loses life points. However, the silver lining is uh, for every life point lost, you could actually use that um, to get rid of useless cards for a useless card from your uh, hand. So the kind of paradox here is the more life you lose, that's actually useful <laughs> to be able to get rid of those 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 counterproductive cards from your hand. Now, the balance that you have to strike, of course, is you don't want to lose too much life, <laughs> right? Yep. So th th there's a there's a fine balance that you got to strike here of, you know, don't lose too much life, but also get rid of those uh, cards from your deck and add, you know, there's also the judgment of adding the better cards to your deck um, because you need to build up your deck for the greater challenges and greater hazards that lie ahead in the game. Component wise, there are 72 cards in the box made up of 30 hazard slash fight cards. As Martin mentioned, the uh, 30 hazard cards are also fight cards. So if, if you beat the hazard, you spin it 180 degrees, you add it to your deck as a extra card that you can use in the future when you reshuffle it into your hand. There's 18 Robinson cards, which represents the starting poor skills of Robinson, and then 11 aging cards, which are particularly brutal as you have to shuffle one into your Robinson deck every time you have to reshuffle there. There's also 22 life tokens. They're these nice little wooden green uh, tokens, which I, they look like trees, but maybe they're leaves. I don't know. What do you think, Martin? I think they're leaves. Okay. Uh, they feel like leaves to me. Yeah, <laughs> Wooden that, leaves. As, as soon as, yeah, <laughs> I, I think you're right. And then there's tiles that you can place your cards on. So they help you organize things. you got a Robinson tile, an aging tile, and a hazards tile. And I believe that's it. There's a few extra cards that represent the stages that you're in. And uh, component-wise, I believe that's everything. Small footprint and easy to get into. So, uh, Martin, what's your experience with the game? Um, So I actually first kind of like... Um, started playing the mobile app on my from my phone um as i you know as i had placed an order for the game because i of course as with so much of these things i'd read about i'd read about it on uh solo board gamers facebook group uh and then i decided to try to use the app to teach myself um the app is okay it's not great but it did successfully teach me how to play the game and then i played my first three four or five times died horribly didn't get past the first stage got super frustrated kept on going six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times on the app. Um, just uh, what the hell? Pardon my French. You know, it's like <laughs> it didn't even seem possible for me to get past the first stage, let alone, you're kidding me, it's got three stages and then I have to fight two sets of pirates? Like this is impossible. There's no way. Like this literally like in my brain, I'm like, there's no way. Like this is this game is stupid. Stupid. You know, you ask my relationship with the game, my personal experience, and then somewhere around the, the, the 15th to 20th time I played the game on the app, This I think it was on a, on a flight, <laughs> I was doing this, and this was playing over and over again, and um, and then the, the it was like the, the heavens parted. And the and the light shone through them, and 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 I, I came to an epiphany, which we'll talk about later. 
and then I actually didn't win yet, <laughs> but I figured out a path to winning is, yeah. So I'll, that, that's what I'll say for right now about that piece, and I'll, I'll return to that point. But um, yeah, so I, I had a lot of ups and downs initially, and and now we're now we're cool. Now Friday and I are cool. We're very cool. Yeah. <laughs> But not with his big brother Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. Right. Never going to be totally cool different. with that one. No. <laughs> that's a totally different movie there. Uh, yeah. So my relationship with it is not nearly as, as storied, unfortunately. I bought it a year and year and a half ago, something like that, late 2018, to uh, take with me on business trips if I uh, had something. Because it was really easy to stick into a bag. As I said, it's so small. And I played it several times. It was frustrating in that I never won a game once. I, maybe I won one, but I it was enough to make me want to constantly keep trying it. And as you said, it's like you got these stages you're going through, and it's nearly impossible, especially with the two pirates. Not alone one pirate, but two of them. Oh man, it's 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 insane. So you you have this. I don't know. It it, it just it it became a love hate relationship for me. And so in the course of deciding what we were going to review next year and coming up with Friday, it seemed like oh yeah okay well, I'll. I'll take a dive into that again. I made it a point to play 10 games mm -hmm. and I lost every single one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Expected so behavior. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, I kind of, I'm going to play it until I win. No, nope. if I do that, I'll be sitting here until goodness <laughs> knows when. I think my, I think my overall win loss here is uh, three wins out of 50 tries. <laughs> wow. Yeah. She, yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. I mean, I, I, I would not dispute that. <laughs> Yep. So yeah. So what we're saying, it's very difficult to play, obviously, but so. very satisfying. Oops, that might be a spoiler alert. I don't. I don't <laughs> want. <to. laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, besides being so small, it's cheap. I think I bought it for twenty five bucks. Yeah. But it's seventeen right now, and it's still out there. So you know, mm -hmm. it's not like you're going to be out a lot if you if you give it a try. You might have the same experience. And just for that, I think for that. No, sorry, go ahead. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The the the, no, the value, the the ROI, the return on investment, the value you get yes. for that is ridiculous. It's off the charts. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's a small price to pay for a game that you're going to get to the table dozens of times. Literally, I mean, you know, it's it's just a great little time consumer. So, so that said, so Martin, what did you think of the components? The components, first of all, I like the boards. So you mentioned the. Um, the aging board, the stage board, and the uh, board that contains the um, the hazard cards, right? What I like about them is they're, the art is nice and thematic. It really, you know, uh, reinforces the uh, desert island theme or the jungle theme. Um, and they're very thick. They're, they're, they don't bend easily. Um, so they actually, for, for, for being kind of like five-inch square boards, um, they feel you know, not cheap. They feel premium. And that's, that's a nice surprise for a, a game that you said that's like $25. So, um, cause I've definitely bought $30 and $35 games where the boards are embarrassingly thin. And, and then like you leave the game out overnight, not, not this one, but other ones that have I, I will not mention what game, but you leave the boards out overnight, you leave it set up. And then in the morning you come and then they're curled upward. Like, uh, yeah, so that that's not that's not the issue with this with this game, with the boards in this game. The uh, wooden leaf life tokens are <laughs> life leaves are, are 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 very nice. They're small, but they are uniform. So the, I don't find any like manufacturing defects with them. You know, so I like the fact, that, and they're wood. You know, they're not plastic or anything like that. Uh, about the cards. Um, I like the fact that they're not poker size cards. They're not your 2.5 inch wide by 3.5 inch. These are more, I believe these are, they're not tarot. I don't know what this size is, but they are, uh, and you know what? I think these are bridge size cards. So they are tall, slightly taller and slightly slimmer than poker size cards. And and for some reason that, that feels nice to me. Um, it feels appropriate. Um, the, my one knock on the cards is that they're not linen finished cards. So they do, they do not feel like premium cards. But, you know, it's a $25 game. You don't expect to get linen finish, um, you know, because that does add significantly to the manufacturing cost. But I like the fact that they went with a bridge size card as opposed to. Um, yeah. Now, now, that's how I feel about the physical components. Don't get me started on the art. I hate the art. <laughs> Which is why really? I... 
which is why I, I decided to retheme it, right? Because to me, the art is right. a turnoff. Like if you look at Robinson's face on some of these cards, like he looks like goofy. You know, it doesn't it doesn't inspire me to help him at all. I'm like, go, you're, you're on your own, buddy. Go go get go get eaten by those wild animals. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> right? Wow. But, but then yeah. when I changed it to, to uh, The Martian and my, my rethink to Mark Watney, then I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll help you out because I like you. <laughs> Not like that goofy Robinson over there. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. You, you should do a... You should do a retheme where it's called the island, and you're trying to kill Robinson. Mm. <laughs> you play the wild animals. You play the cannibals. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. so uh, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I guess you could say it's a mixed bag for me in terms of the components. Um, yeah. Did you find the cards hard to shuffle? I think I read somewhere somebody had an issue with it. I did not. No. I mean, they are odd sized, no. but I'm a terrible riffle shuffler, and I wouldn't oh, do that normally anyway I... because, yeah. It's hard. My shuffling skills are horrendous. I, I actually, like, I did a tutorial video on uh, on YouTube that has about like thirty thousand views now, where uh, how to make print and play cards. And at the end of it, I shuffle the deck that I just made. And in the process of shuffling, I just spilled them all on the on the ground. So that was great, and that's nice. recorded for all eternity, for all for all posterity. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, as far as the rules are concerned, I. You know, the rule book itself, I think they're okay written. I just have an issue with it because I guess my eyes are, are worse now. As, but oh, yeah, been going the, bad the print since, is very small. You're right. Yep. it's My eyes have been going bad since second grade. So it's been a while. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it, it, it's hard to get that. And, you know, the funny thing is when I when we were getting back into this game to relearn it or to play it for this review, I didn't even bother to read the rules. I actually looked at the – there's two. There's, there's a rule book. And then there's a setup. And I looked at the setup, of course, to figure out how to set the game up. But I went online to BGG and I looked up a how to play video. Uh, I just happened to pick Rado for Rado's run through it. Rado right. runs through it, rather. And he explained it pretty quickly in, you know, 20 minutes and I'm ready to go. So I, right. I appreciate that because it's so simple to get back into. It's like, it's... but the rule book just had, a, I had issues with it. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it, you're right. It's one of those kinds of rule books where um, it makes the game seem more complicated than it is. Yes. Um, so I, I think that if you already know how to play, explaining it to somebody else doesn't take that much time. Um, and then also the, because the individual cards have certain effects that require a little bit of explanation that aren't, you know, a lot of them are are um, self-explanatory when you look at them. Like if you get... Uh, you know, plus two cards. That's pretty self-explanatory. But then you come to a card and it says one X below the pile. And you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? And then you look in the rule book and it's also, it's, it's still not clear, you know? So yeah, so, and I don't know if it has to do with the fact that it's originally written in German um, and then was translated. I don't know if that's if that's the issue. Um, but yeah, definitely the, the end result is if you're coming to this game, the the rules in the box make it seem more complicated than it actually is. It's not a very complicated game. No, not at all. So for the good of the game, for me, it's once you know the system, it plays very quickly. It's very easy to get into. Uh, if you spend time away from it, it should only take you a few minutes to get reacquainted and ramp back up. I mean, if you play it, like I said, I played it 10 times. And so it's really reinforced in me now. If I give it six months and I come back to it, it'll come back to me in no time. Uh, it's got a small footprint which is excellent. The components, as Martin said, are, are very good for a game in this price range. And uh, being such just such a small little package, it's just awesome. And it's a true solo game, too. There's no two-player variant or anything like that. So this has got a lot of good points to it. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, for me, um, I get to a point now where I don't need to refer to the rules anymore uh, to play the game. And it's nice that it's a solo game where that's possible, right? Because the vast majority of the solo games in my library, I have to have the rules out no matter how many times I've played it, right? <laughs> um, and, and so the fact that, um, you know, this is a game where it's a small box and you can set it up fast, super fast, and you can start playing, jump right in. Um, once you're familiar with the rules, that's a really, really good thing. Um, now, but the, my main good thing about this game, after I've played it over 50 times now, um, and after I've you know like been familiar with it for a couple of years now, is I think, in my opinion, this is one of the best design games I have ever encountered. 
um, from a mechanism perspective. Uh, it's the kind of thing that I, I've designed a couple of games myself. I'm a, you know, kind of amateur fledgling game designer. And so I look into this stuff and I research this stuff. And, and to me, this game is a masterpiece of just, like I said, that idea of balance, right? Like, um, where you have to, you have to, you're going to lose life. You're going to get frustrated, but that can also be channeled into a useful way where you can use the lost life to um, get rid of or cull bad cards from your deck, which is which is necessary for your success, right? So just and and that the, the thematically that makes sense that you're learning from experience you're getting hurt in the process but you are but you're literally like that you're using that that you're learning from your mistake uh to get better and hopefully you know uh find success in the future so so that i mean to think about like how how do you uh translate that mechanically and then to how do you make it, it, it how do you implement that in a game that's so small and such an economical rule set um yeah, I, if I if I try to look at this game from a game design perspective, it's it's a towering achievement in my humble opinion. So that's one of my main good things about it. As far as bad things are concerned about the game, to be totally objective, I think maybe there's a few that we could discuss here. It's it's not a deal breaker by any stretch of the imagination for me. Just from my perspective, it has a lack of complexity to it, which is, is strength. You know, don't get me wrong here, but there's not much to it. So if you're looking for a more deeper experience, this is something you probably want to pass over, right? So, but just for the experience, for the small size, it gives you a lot. But if you're looking for something like Robinson Crusoe, for instance, then, you know, you might want to go with that, which is a whole <laughs> level of punishment, a whole different level of of Dante's Inferno well, there. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot more components. I mean, just have you ever right. just, just, just yeah. organizing the tokens for that thing could be a Ugh. day. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think I did that a few months ago because you were talking about it and I pulled it out again and I was like, <laughs> what am I doing this to myself for? Anyway. So yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a bad necessarily, but you know, again, if you're, if you're a person who likes more complex meaty types of games, you probably aren't going to get too much out of this. And I also think that the hazard decks or the hazard deck rather, can be repetitive just because there's 30 cards in that deck and as you win and take the cards out and turn them into fight cards for later use that deck gets smaller and i think i i didn't go through the deck and i should have done this beforehand but i think there's probably the same event repeated several times like go out to yeah the you're right might be four of those uh yes. and i don't know if they're different uh different challenge numbers to them I don't think we spoke to that actually. Uh, that they are not. But, They're the same challenge numbers. Okay. okay. <laughs> so there you go. Well, you know, so it's the same thing. It's like, okay, here I got to go out to the boat again. Okay. Wild animals again. Okay. Cannibals again. You know, it, I thought maybe if there was some more, it might make it a little more interesting. But again, I don't think this is a too big a deal for the scope of the game. I think it covers things nicely. If you're looking for more diversity in your hazards, though, eh, there's never really, really much to it there. Maybe I'm off base here by saying this is a bad thing. I don't know. Well, no. Well, you think about it, it makes thematic sense. You're stuck on a jungle desert island. There's not much to do there. <laughs> your no, your right. days yeah. are going to pretty much be, what am I going to do today? Well, I might try to make it out to the boat. Oh, cannibals. You know, I mean, like, that's... So, this yeah. is, this is Robinson's life, day in, day out. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, like doing other things too, like say, uh, <laughs> climb a tree to get coconuts. That could be a hazard, or explore a cave. Oh yeah, you're right. No, a or or I, you know, yeah. go out to sea to go diving for crabs. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> I'm having know. a little fun with you, but yeah, you're right. You no, know. no, you're right. You're right. You're <laughs> right. It, it's like it's like look at the movie Castaway. I keep going back to that in my mind. It's like, well, what is there really to do? <laughs> You're trying to right. learn as you go along, and you're, you're going to be repetitive I mean, to build up you your could, skill. You, know? you could talk to a volleyball. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, uh, and in fact, speaking of somebody who actually rethemed this game, I mean, I did a straight retheme. I didn't change anything, which means that if the hazard card was um, go to go out to the boat in the original game, my version was five, seven different copies of go out to the Rover. Right. <laughs> um, so, so you're right. There's, there's very little variation in terms of the hazards. Um, it doesn't bother me so much though. Um, because 
I get so wrapped up in the figure. What? Okay, so I'm still talking about good things about this game for me. Sorry. <laughs> is is um in on each turn you get I get sucked into the puzzle, the complexity of. How do I possibly work with the cards that are out here and work with the abilities to get more cards out here, um, you know, to be able to actually hit this seemingly impossible points target here? Like, you know, at some point you're going to get to like, uh, you need to make nine points, but you've only got two cards to do it with. You're like, what? <laughs> it's impossible. Except it's not, right? Because what if those two cards allow you to draw more cards? Or, you know, like there's so many, there's not many, but there's like half a dozen different abilities in this game. And within that, that uh, you know, um, range of abilities, it, depending on in the order that they come out in your in your turn, you get this really delicious, to me, really delicious sense of it seemed impossible at first, but oh my gosh, if I do this and I do this extra thing and then this and then combine these things, I made it. And then there's like this 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 burst of satisfaction in you, you know, this, this micro burst of of um I I that you you actually conquered this seemingly impossible hazard, which um and it does it turn after turn after turn. So I don't really like micro focus on the fact that, and that, and that was another, yet another trip to the raft. You know what I mean? All of which is to say that yes, if you're if you're looking at if you're looking at this as a purely thematic, and I feel weird saying this because I'm a thematic gamer. Um, if you look at this from a purely thematic perspective, you could almost say you could almost argue that the theme is pasted on, and and normally that would be a deal breaker for me. But it's not in this game because it's so – the card play to me is so fascinating. Um, yeah. So so all of which is to say that I, I acknowledge your bad point that the hazards can be repetitive, but it doesn't bother me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't bother me either. I'm just bringing it up because somebody might find this a lacking in that regard. But, I mean, again, it's a $17 game. So what do you – it's a cheap game, right? It's it's inexpensive, so it's yes. not it's not going to provide a, all right, it's not going to provide a ton of content in that regard. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but somebody else might think that. So that's the only reason why I bring that up. And as far as ugly points, there's really not that much here. The only ugly thing I can really think of is it's so freaking hard. It's like Robinson Crusoe light, but it's like it was carved off of that very densely difficult game to become its own little independent shard of black hole destruction <laughs> that was really um, nicely said that's a good, yeah, good turn I, of phrase <laughs> yeah, i'm proud of that yeah i appreciate that so yeah it's it's a it, it's just very hard but again it's it's endearing in that regard as well so what do you think yeah so uh, again i'm gonna i'm gonna temper that that statement by saying that yeah, it is hard and and a lot of people um justifiably get feel that initial frustration with it that that you and i felt and then they don't want to go past it because <clears throat> quite honestly, you know, if you play a game 10, 15, 20 times and you lose every single time, you would be perfectly justified in saying, screw this. I don't want to play this anymore. And I only paid whatever, 25 bucks for it. I'm going to resell it or I'm going to just shelve it or something like that. That's that's a perfectly valid thing for a lot of people to say or decide about this game. It's not like it takes up a lot of space on your shelf or anything. Right. Um, so, but the thing, <laughs> here's the thing for me, right? And is that if you punch through and if you get to that, that light bulb moment with this game, so here's where I try to pay off what I set up, you know, however many minutes ago earlier on in this podcast is, is uh, my experience was because I felt like I had been playing the game wrong the whole time. You know what I mean? You know, when I thought when I thought it was impossible to even get past the first stage, I was playing it like a standard deck builder. And in a standard deck builder, you have low level cards and your job is to uh, acquire higher level cards, upgrade your cards. And so your deck is better, you know. Um, and, and that's how you win the game. I mean, that's how you win in Aeon's End. That's how you win in Marvel Legendary, et cetera, et cetera. Insert, insert like traditional deck builder here. Um, but that's not really 
so so calling this game a deck builder is actually a misnomer. Um, uh, someone on SBG actually called it a deck destroyer, and I think that's a much more apt description of this game because really early on in the game, what you want to focus on is destroying. Uh, the bad cards from your hand is to uh, spend your lost life points to destroy as many bad cards from your hand as possible so that you can make your deck better and more efficient, right? And once you kind of make that, that flip, that code switch in your mind, then your strategy becomes evident. Then your path to victory becomes much more achievable, um, in my opinion. So, so yeah, um, it can be frustrating. If you don't punch through that frustration, then you're not going to have a great experience with this game. If you punch through that frustration and you get to that plateau of that that realization, um, you know that it's actually a deck destroying game, and and you and then then you've you learn how to really play the game, um, and 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 that ties back to why I said earlier that. As freedom and freeze, how do you even think that way? Like as a deck, as as, as a game designer myself, I'm, I can't even wrap my head around how do you design a game intentionally to have that effect. Like that's bananas to me. So anyway, I'm just I'm just a fanboy, I guess. Of uh, and and so it just goes to show that there's 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 people there's designers working in board gaming who really know their stuff. <laughs> you know, and and it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to play a game design designed by somebody who really knows their stuff. And this is one of those. If you want a game designed by somebody who really knows their stuff, Friday is that game for you. That's that's the last kind of you know gushingly positive thing I will say about this game. <laughs> so stop discussion, Martin. What do you think? Uh, I think I've already telegraphed the ending for me. Uh, for me, this is definitely a stomp game, um, and I define a stomp game. So we don't we don't give it out very often. This is right. my first time legitimately giving out a stomp for any game, uh, as long as I've been on the podcast. Um, and it has to be something that uh, I think every solo gamer should have, should experience and probably should have in their collection. And um, from my, from that perspective, yes, definitely Friday gets the stomp of approval from me. Okay. Yeah. And I have to agree with you there. Actually, I don't think we intend to give this out easily or that often. And for the purposes for, for what this game covers, for what it, does for how it provides you joy and interest. I think it's it's an excellent choice for a stomp of approval. So we will agree there definitely for sure. Wow. I'm I'm impressed <laughs> that we agreed. We right, we actually agreed that. on something. <laughs> how about that? You know, <laughs> we always do, but you know, well not always, but anyway. All right. Well ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to this long-ish episode of uh, Solo Source podcast reviewing Friday uh, we want to say thank you for listening as always. We are also mentioning we're a part of the Dice Tower Network. And to see more from us here at Solosource, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Solosource. You can follow us on Instagram at Solosource Podcast or shoot us an email at Solosource Podcast at gmail.com. We're also on BGG. And uh, of course, we again ask you to go check out Stone Valley Games. Thanks again to Eric and Wendy and all those fine folks over there at Stone Valley Games for supporting the podcasts. Uh, Martin, any final thoughts? Um, just occurs to me to remind everyone that if you would like to get your own spanking shiny copy of the Solosaurus uh, micro badge on BGG, just uh, send me a geek mail. My uh, BGG handle is at Dr. Henry Armitage. It's all so Dr. Henry Armitage. And then I will spot you the geek gold so that you can uh, purchase and sport your love for the Solosaurus podcast via the micro badge. All right, everybody. Thank you. As again, my name is Michael Eckenfels. And this has been Martin Gonzalez. And we thank you once again for listening to this episode of the Solosaurus podcast. We'll talk to you next time. <laughs> <laughs>